Okay, um, so today, uh, well, so yesterday, if you recall, we, we, we spent the day talking about open books, and this is kind of part of uh, this theorem of Giroux. The Giroux's theorem kind of related open books up to positive stabilization um, with uh, contact structures up to isotopy. So today what I'd like to do is start talking about contact structures. Um, luckily, we've already heard some about contact structures. Um, uh, so I'll actually go through that part fairly quickly since we saw a little bit about that yesterday and I, I guess I heard you heard about that last week as well. Um, and then I'll talk about how to relate contact structures to open books and eventually, hopefully, sketch a proof of Giroux's theorem. Um, we might not quite get done with that today, but hopefully we'll at least get a ways into that. So let's get started. So this is the, kind of the second part of the uh, correspondence of part B, contact structures. So, an oriented, kind of, I'll not say oriented over and over again because for me contact structures will always be oriented, but um, an oriented contact structure C on M, and remember throughout these talks M is always a um, closed oriented three manifold, um, is an oriented plane field of course a plane field is always sitting in the tangent bundle of the manifold such means at every point we have a, a plane picked out um, such that there exists a one form alpha uh, satisfying uh, C is the kernel of alpha and 2 alpha wedge d alpha is positive. So remember M is an oriented manifold, so um, the positivity condition as uh, Andrash pointed out the other day uh, means that this is a positive multiple of the volume form on M. Uh, and let me just kind of remark again as Andrash did yesterday, um, this is actually not just a contact structure, um, an oriented contact structure, it actually happens to be um, what's called a positive contact structure because of this condition. A negative contact structure would have the other inequality. Um, people do talk about those, but at least in the past many years, people only talk about positive ones, so I'll stick to just positive contact structures. But again, technically, we should probably have the word positive there if you want. Okay. So a very brief example. Kind of the, the first classical example is R3 with a, with a contact structure being the kernel of uh, dz plus r squared d theta. And let me actually try to draw a little bit of a picture of this so you maybe get a, an idea of what kind of a contact structure kind of looks like. Um, so you're in R3. I'll draw it in Cartesian coordinates even though I'm using polar coordinates, but that's all right. Um, so what happens here if R is zero, if R is zero, uh, then the, the, so you're on the uh, z-axis here, then the, the form is just uh, dz, so the kernel is uh, things perpendicular to the dz-axis, so you have kind of horizontal planes. Hopefully those look like horizontal planes. So in the tangent plane at every point, you have a horizontal plane picked out. So now as you move out along, say, the, um, say the x-axis here, um, what happens is, as you move away from the origin, you get a, a component here, which uh, means in your kernel, your kernel will be spanned by DDR. That will always be in the kernel. But then you'll also get um, kind of uh, DDZ, uh, we'll say R DDZ minus DD theta, which kind of tilts the plane. Um, so it's no longer a horizontal plane, it's kind of a tilted plane. And what happens is you move out along the axis, it keeps tilting more and more and more. So again, this is a picture hopefully uh, most people are fairly familiar with, but I think staring at this picture and thinking about this form will help you understand the contact structure quite a bit. So again, it starts out horizontal. As you move out along a ray, any ray perpendicular to the z-axis, you get this kind of 90-degree twist. Okay, so here's one picture of a contact structure. And let me give you one more contact structure that will be important for us in just a moment. Uh, so this is on an open manifold, of course, so we want a contact structure now on a closed manifold. So S3, um, as we did the other day, we'll think of it as sitting inside of... Um, uh, C2 is the unit sphere inside of C2, and we'll let uh, the contact planes, so this is, of course, well, so C is the kernel of uh, R1 squared d theta 1 plus R2 squared d theta 2, where we're using coordinates on C, Z1, Z2, which again in polar coordinates we'll write
like that. Okay. <clears throat> so another way to think about this is that there actually, it turns out this contact plane is the set of complex tangencies to S3. So if you take the tangent space to S3, hit it with I and intersect it, you'll get a plane in the tangent space to S3 and that plane is this thing picked out here. Okay. So I can't quite draw this, but in some sense, this is the compactification of this. You can actually embed this in the complement of a point here, so the contact planes there go to the contact planes there. Okay. So let me just state a few facts about contact structures that we'll need. Um, so the first one that's nice to know is that uh, all three manifolds have uh, contact structures. And in fact, we're going to prove this in just a few moments. We're going to give the, the, the Thurston Winkelkamper proof um, using open book decompositions uh, that all three manifolds have contact structures. Uh, two, uh, locally, all contact structures look the same. So this is usually called Darboux's theorem. And what I mean by locally all contact structures look the same is I mean that, uh, uh, so i.e., uh, if pi a point in mi ci, so if we have a point in um, contact manifolds and i is 0 or 1, so we have two different points in two different contact manifolds, uh, there exists neighborhoods. Uh, UI of PI in MI and a diffeomorphism phi from U0 to U1 such that phi, when you push forward the contact planes, one set of contact planes, you get the other set of contact planes on that uh, set. Um, by the way, such a diffeomorphism, a diffeomorphism that preserves the contact planes is called a contactomorphism, um, so I'll probably use that terminology a little bit later. Right. So let's see, another thing we're going to need, um, so the third fact is uh, suppose we're given, um, so given two contact manifolds as above, so I equals zero, one, um, there is a contact connected sum. So just like you can take a connected sum of three manifolds, you can actually, in a very canonical way, take the connected sum of contact structures. Um, so connected sums of M1. Uh, defined as follows. <coughs> so we can find uh, balls bi in mi uh, and an orientation reversing diffeomorphism uh, f from the boundary of m0 minus b0 maybe closure, I don't know if you like open or closed balls, but um, to boundary M1, B1, uh, such that on M0 connected sum M1, so of course M0 connected sum M1 is formed by taking the disjoint union of these two things. So on here, uh, the contact structures, so on here, uh, C1 restricted to M, sorry, C0 restricted to here. So if you just restrict the respective contact structures to the, the, the various components here, this uh, uh, gives a well-defined contact structure. on M0 connected sum M1. 
So of course the whole, the whole thing here is you have to arrange that the contact planes kind of near the boundary of the ball here, near the boundary of the ball here, more or less look the same so that when you glue them together, they actually fit together to give you a contact structure on the whole thing. And it's not too hard to do that, but I don't think it's worth spending the time here to kind of in detail write that out. But um, might be worth thinking about a little bit if you're interested. Okay, so that's going to be important. And now uh, maybe one other fact. Uh, if there exists a one parameter family CT, T in 0, 1 of contact structures on M, then there exists a uh, one parameter family of diffeomorphisms phi t from m to m uh, such that if you push forward the contact plane, say C0, uh, you'll get Ct. Okay. So this is saying if you have a family of contact structures, you can actually find a family of diffeomorphisms that generates that family of contact structures. So something happening in the tangent space can actually, you can actually think of it as happening by diffeomorphisms of the manifold and is kind of created by diffeomorphisms of the manifold. So it's kind of one way to say it is to kind of integrate the isotopy upstairs, the isotopy in the tangent space, to actually a, an isotopy of the manifold itself. Uh, this is usually, uh, this is called uh, Gray's theorem. Um, and I guess lastly I should say definition. Um, C0 and C1 are called isotopic if uh, there exists a one parameter family. of contact structures between them. Okay, so finally at this point, although you probably knew some of these definitions already, but finally at this point we actually have all the terms in Giroux's theorem defined. Remember, on one side it was contact structures up to isotopy, so that's this, or you could think of it as this using Gray's theorem. Um, and on the other side it was open books up to positive stabilization. Okay. Uh, yes, dt star c0, thank you. <laughs> the other thing made absolutely no sense whatsoever. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So now that we have all of the kind of players in the theorem kind of defined, let's try to see what the relation between them is. So that's in the following definition. So a contact structure C on M is supported by an open book. B pi. So remember this is a link in M whose complement is fibered and pi is the vibration on the complement. Um, if uh, C is defined by a one form alpha uh, such that one D alpha is an area form on the pages of the open book. So on the fibers of this vibration pi, if d alpha is an area form, you need that. And the second condition you need is that d alpha is, sorry, is that alpha is positive on, on uh, B. What does that mean? Remember, B isn't just a link. B is an oriented link. So since it's an oriented link, you have an oriented tangent vector. When you, you plug in, you want a tangent vector into alpha, you're supposed to get something positive. Okay. So maybe due to time, I won't write down the exercise I was going to write down after, but let me just say the exercise. Um, <coughs> this is a convenient definition to work with, but I think intuitively it's nice to have the, uh, another definition of supported, what it means for a contact structure to be supported by an open book. 
And another way to think about a contact structure being supported by an open book is the following. Suppose you have an open book and a contact structure. That contact structure is supported by it if you can isotop the contact structure through contact structures to be arbitrarily close to the pages of the open book as oriented plane fields. So the contact planes are oriented, the tangent space to the fibers are oriented, um, and if you can isotop those contact planes arbitrarily close to the tangent planes of the open book while keeping the contact planes transverse to B. So if you can do that, that's equivalent to being supported, the, 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 the contact structure being supported by that open book. So that's a, a kind of a more intuitive way of thinking about what's going on. Um, and it's equivalent to this, um, but it certainly requires a little bit of thought to, to see that. So let me give you an example of a contact structure that's supported by an uh, open book. So. so if you remember the other day, um, we had this vibration of the complement of the unknot. I um, remember the unknot was the set of uh, points where R1 was equal to zero um, if you wrote things in polar coordinates. And then the vibration of the complement, you could write uh, like this. Uh, this supports uh, C, uh, C, which I'll call C standard, um, which is the kernel. Well, it's just the one we talked about before. Okay. Let me call this alpha. And actually, it's very easy to see that this is true. I, I mean, I'll, I suppose I should leave it to you as an exercise, but this is easy to see um, just as follows. So a page is parameterized by, uh, say, f. So the page corresponding to some particular point theta 1 is parameterized as follows, again, in polar coordinates r theta. Um, So you're kind of parameterizing the page in the second two coordinates, really, um, but you just do the, the, what you have to do to R to make sure that you're on the unit sphere, and then theta 1 is fixed. Okay, so this gives you a parameterization of the page, um, and it's pretty easy to check, so you can check uh, that F star, theta 1, of D alpha is, uh, so I worked it out, it's 2R dr wedge D theta. Okay, and of course that's a volume form on the disk, so great. And you can also check that uh, alpha, if you take the tangent to uh, u and you plug it into alpha, you'll get 1. If you take kind of the obvious tangent to u, um, which is uh, d theta 1, actually. Uh, sorry, d theta 2. Well, anyway, you can figure it out, but you get 1. So, you, so it's pretty easy to check that uh, this really does support uh, that standard contact structure. Excuse me? Oh, push it up? Sure. Um, and let's see. So an exercise. Show H plus pi plus. So remember, this is the uh, hop vibration with a positive hop link. And remember, the positive hop link was the one with a left-handed twist for some strange reason. Um, also supports. Uh, C standard on S3, but H minus pi minus does not. Okay, so that's a nice exercise to work out. This is going to be an important fact for us, and it's also kind of nice to know that this H minus thing doesn't. Okay, well now we come to kind of a theorem that kind of got everything started, and it's a, th a theorem due to Thurston and Finkelkamper. from 1975, and it says that every um, open book decomposition supports uh, a contact structure. So every open book decomposition 
sigma phi of M supports a contact structure. Okay, so this is the most basic theorem that really gets us started. It tells us that there's some hope of a map from open books to contact structures. So it turns out there's lots of places you can find this proof, but let me just kind of uh, quickly run through a couple of the details that go into this proof because, again, it's a very seminal to what we're trying to do here. So recall, if the manifold M has the open book uh, uh, sigma phi, so I guess sigma phi is an abstract open book that gives me M, um, that means that M is uh, the mapping torus. So the mapping torus, which we call was uh, sigma cross 0, 1, mod out by this equivalence where you kind of identify front and back using phi, uh, union uh, with some diffeomorphism, uh, the number of boundary components of sigma, disjoint union of S1 cross D2. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to put a contact structure on the mapping torus first, and then we're going to see that you can extend it over uh, those solid tori. So first, put the contact structure on uh, sigma phi. So claim there exists a one form lambda on uh, sigma such that lambda equals one plus s d theta near boundary sigma. So I guess I t should tell you the coordinates I'm going to use. So, um, you know, so the surface is some complicated surface, but near the boundary I can always parameterize a little neighborhood of the boundary um, by uh, s and theta. So theta, of course, is the, the, the coordinate kind of running around the circle direction. s is the, is the direction kind of running into the manifold, and it's going to run from 0 to 1. So I can kind of parameterize um, this little region as uh, 0, 1 cross uh, s1 with the s here and the theta here. Okay. And then near the boundary, the one form can be taken to be this thing and... Uh, a one form on sigma, just on sigma. So where's the d theta? d theta is the coordinate in the s. So your surface, a neighborhood of the boundary is s1 cross interval. Oh, 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 okay. <coughs> right, right. Yeah, sorry, it's not the circle in the, in the vibration. No, no, it's the circle in the boundary. Maybe that's a little confusing, but okay. And two, uh, d lambda is a volume form on sigma. So it's actually going to construct this one form for you, but maybe I'll leave that as an exercise, again, just due to time, so we can kind of move on to more interesting things. So exercise, show this. It's not particularly difficult, but you have to think about it for a moment if you haven't seen it before. <coughs> uh, let's see. Uh, claim two, which I'll also leave to you to check, is that the set of one forms satisfying one and two is convex. So the set of one forms is uh, satisfying one and two, so that night, well, anyway, satisfying one and two is convex. Um, so given such a lambda on sigma, uh, phi star lambda is another such lambda. Right? It's pretty easy to see, right? Because phi is the identity near the boundary, so it's certainly going to condi uh, preserve condition one, because it's not really doing anything near the boundary. And the second condition, well, it's a diffeomorphism, so it's certainly going to take a volume form to a volume form. So, um, so that's great. Um, and now we can kind of let lambda, so let's see, the coordinates I'm using here, t, x. So here um, you've got sigma cross 0, 1, so x is going to be a point in sigma, and t is a point in the interval. Um, let this just be lambda. 
lambda at the point x. So it's a one form, and it's one form of the x, uh, plus one minus t uh, phi star lambda at x. So this is, a, so for each, uh, well, so this is a one form on here, and if we let, so now let alpha uh, equal lambda tx uh, plus k dt, the claim is, or maybe I won't say claim, I'll say exercise, and it's a fairly easy exercise for k large uh, alpha is a contact form on sigma cross zero one. And not only is it a contact form on sigma cross zero one, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that by construction, it actually descends to the mapping torus. It's the contact form on here that descends <coughs> to the mapping torus. Okay? So we have our contact structure on the map, or our contact form on the mapping torus. Again, there's a few details to check, but it's fairly easy to check these, so I'll just leave them as exercises. So now, we need to extend uh, alpha over uh, S1 cross D2. Actually, there might be lots of copies of S1 cross D2 we have to extend over. If we can extend over one, we can certainly extend over the other ones, too. Right. If, um, so remember, we're gluing S1 cross D2 into, uh, into the mapping torus. Um, well, let me kind of maybe, let's see. Well, let me write down this map. So. And here I mean a particular boundary component. Um, if we use coordinates here, uh, uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't use phi, huh? Maybe we'll use capital psi r psi um, maps to 1 minus r, 1 over 2 pi phi, 1 over 2 pi. Uh, let's see. I guess what I'm doing here is actually defining a map from kind of a neighborhood of the boundary here to a neighborhood of the boundary here. Uh, let's see. This is capital Psi. Psi. Okay, good. So that's the map I want. Um, then if you let alpha twiddle uh, equal the pullback by this map, um, maybe I'll call it F. I shouldn't call it F because I'm going to use F later. H, H star alpha. Uh, then you can actually see that this has an explicit form of 2 pi R D theta, or sorry, R D capital psi plus K over 2 pi uh, D psi. You might wonder where these two pi's came from. It actually came from the fact, I didn't go through this proof, but when I went through this proof, um, I actually kind of normalized the boundary, the boundary circle to have linked one, and kind of naturally over here, the circle has uh, linked two pi. So it's kind of a stupid parameterization. So maybe you could take those out if you want to parameterize things in a more reasonable manner. But anyway, um, uh, we can extend alpha twiddle to all of S1 cross D2 by a form of the form, okay, so that's a terrible sentence, but a form of the form uh, so a form of that form uh, where FR and GR parameterize that arc. So this is a 1 and this is a K. 
and this is the f axis kind of, and this is the g axis. Okay? So if you take an f and a g that parameterize this, so kind of flat there, and I leave to you to check that it's true. Um, it's kind of fun to see that this is a one form. When this one form happens to be a contact form, and you can actually see that um, alpha twiddle kind of has this form. Um, well, again, let me leave it to you to check that. Anyway, this allows you to kind of extend over each solid torus, and this kind of completes a very rapid sketch of this theorem. But this theorem is written down in many places, in particular the Thurston Winkelkamper paper is quite uh, easy to read, so maybe I'll leave it to that and also leave it to the written version of, of these lectures um, for more details. So theorem, a fairly easy theorem, but a very important one due to Giroux in 2000, or at least it was first written down in kind of uh, some form in 2000, in some published form in 2000. Um, I'm not sure if there's really a proof there, but uh, like I said, it's a pretty easy, oh, maybe I should give you the theorem before I sketch the proof, or how about I prove and you can figure out what I'm supposed to be proving. Um, okay, two contact structures. that are supported by the same open book um, are isotopic. Okay. So that's the theorem. Um, so a sketch of proof. So given ci equal the kernel of alpha i, i equals 0 and 1, uh, supported by uh, b pi, let phi r psi be coordinates on a neighborhood of B. So near one of the components of the binding, let those be the coordinates, and we can do that for each component of the binding. Um, set uh, alpha equal f of r d psi, where f, the graph of f, is the following. So it's going to be zero for a while, zero near the origin, uh, then it kind of ramps up, and it's constantly one. Um, after you get out past some, ep some very small epsilon, okay? So that's the graph of F. Uh, extend alpha by uh, the pullback of uh, d theta, uh, where, uh, remember, pi is a map from m minus b to s1, and we're going to put the coordinate theta on s1. So just pull back d theta, and you get some one form, and um, you can fairly easily convince yourself that d alpha can be extended by this pullback. Um, and now the exercise that finishes the proof, uh, the first part is that alpha i k which equals alpha i. So alpha i was, of course, given by the contact structure. Um, plus k alpha um, is contact for k bigger than zero. Okay, so we can start to perturb our original contact structure, or our original contact form, alpha i. Uh, we can kind of, you know, kind of ramp up this k and kind of get this extra factor in there. And the second thing is that, uh, 4k large uh, alpha s equal one, 1 minus s alpha 0k plus s alpha 1k is contact. Okay. So again, these are fairly easy things to check, and you just check these things. And what I've done here is I've written down a one-parameter family of one forms going from uh, alpha 1 to alpha uh, from alpha 0 to alpha 1, so this gives me one primary family of contact structures from, al from C0 to C1, and that tells you they're isotopic, okay? Well, so, 
Cs equal the kernel of alpha s is an isotopy. Okay, and that finishes the proof. theorem is, must be due to Giroux, but it hasn't kind of explicitly been written down as far as I can tell anywhere. Um, so you have the manifold associated to, associated to uh, this open book, um, and you also have the contact structure associated with this open book. And you take the contact connected sum contact connected some of uh, that with the uh, manifold and contact structure associated with some other open book. And this is equal to uh, the manifold associated to uh, the uh, Murasugi sum of the two open books. And the contact structure is also the contact connected sum. So remember, last time we actually proved a theorem, well, okay, I sketched part of a proof of a theorem that said on the three-manifold level, when you do the Murasugi sum, this kind of takes the connected sum of the ambient manifolds. Well, I claim the same thing happens uh, for these contact structures as well that are associated to the open books. Um, and if you actually go back and really understand the proof on the three-manifold level, this other proof uh, using the fact that su being supported by is equivalent to kind of the contact planes being able to be being isotopic near the, the pages of the open book, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that the contact structures kind of go along for free. No nothing, nothing funny is going on there. So just essentially the same proof um, works here. So exercise. And proving this, again, is basically going back and understanding that other proof on the three-manifold level better. Um, and there's an immediate corollary. So let A be an arc in a surface sigma. Then So we actually already stated this before as a, as a, as a lemma that if you uh, do the stabilization, remember the stabilization, you could think of that as uh, doing the Murasugi sum with, for the plus stabilization, the positive Hopf band, and for the minus stabilization, the, uh, the minus Hopf band. The manifolds are diffeomorphic, so the important part of this corollary is that the contact structures are isotopic, but only if you do the positive stabilization. The contact structures are isotopic if you do the positive stabilization. And this corollary is very simple. Um, <coughs> so the proof, the proof is almost trivial from the previous theorem just because uh, you know that uh, remember, the stabilization was equivalent to doing a Murasugi sum with a positive Hopf band, but the positive Hopf uh, link was, supports the standard contact structure on S3. Um, so the proof uh, essentially, um, the, so M, S. I'll drop the A from the notation just because it's too annoying to write. Um, uh, well, let me just talk about the contact structure level, the three-manifold level we already did. Um, equals uh, C zero phi, uh, so C uh, H plus high plus, okay? So it's just uh, the contact structure is taking a connected sum with this thing, and this is C the standard contact structure on S3. Um, and now you just need to check uh, S3 C standard 
equals uh, the union of two uh, standard three balls. So if you just take a little ball around the origin in the standard contact structure, this is kind of the standard three ball. And you can take two of these things and glue them together and get the standard contact structure on the three sphere. Um, therefore, it's pretty clear what's going on here. When you try to do the, connect, the contact connected sum, you remove a standard three ball from your manifold. You also remove a standard three ball from S3, and then you glue back in the complement of that standard three ball in S3, which is the standard three ball in S3. So you haven't really done anything. So the proof is pretty, pretty simple there. But an important remark. Uh, is that uh, C S minus of sigma phi is not uh, in general isotopic to uh, C sigma phi. So if you do a minus stabilization, you typically will get a different contact structure. And again, that's just due to the fact that uh, that the negative Hopf band, the negative Hopf link, does not support the standard uh, contact structure on S3. Excuse me, what was that? Well, as I was writing that, I was trying to think if it's never or just not in general. Uh, that's why I add not in general to make sure I covered my bases. But, um, I think never. I think it actually changes the homotopy class of plane field, but I'm not positive. Andras, do you happen to know? Oh, that's right. You're connected summing with, ah, yes. Okay, good. It does. Uh, depending on the Euler class of the original contact structure. I see. Okay, so always. I'll still leave that there just to be safe, but I think it's always. Um, let's see. Well, so finally, if you combine everything we've said today, if you believe everything we've said today, um, we now have a well-defined map from open books modulo, well, modulo uh, positive stabilization to contact structures modulo isotopy. So given an open book, we get a contact structure. Um, any contact structure supported by the open book is, is, uh, di differs only by isotopy, so you've got that map. And then modding out by positive stabilization from this theorem clearly doesn't change the contact structure you get. So we have this nice well-defined map. And of course, now our goal is to prove that this map is onto and one-to-one. -one. So we now need to prove map is on to and one to one. And I don't think we'll probably quite manage to finish that uh, today, but hopefully we'll get to the on to part. Um, but unfortunately to do that, we actually need a little bit more technology. We need to know a little bit more about contact structures. Um, this afternoon we're going to get a, a, a a description or a discussion of convex surfaces in more detail, but let me just run through the basics of convex surface theory. It's a very useful theory in contact geometry, and we're going to need it to prove, uh, to prove onto. So, So let me just run through a bunch of definitions. Again, a lot of these definitions you've seen before, but just for the sake of completeness, and uh, I'd, I'd like to just kind of run through them again anyway. So, um, so a curve gamma in MC is Legendrian if uh, the tangents to the, to the curve are always contained in the contact planes. So again, I'm going to run through these fairly quick and not make a lot of comments about them because we've seen all these definitions before. Um, but if you do have any questions, please, uh, please stop and ask. Um, so sigma, a surface, 
in MC, uh, then uh, the tangents, if you take er at each point of the surface, if you look at its tangent plane and you intersect it with the contact plane, well, you've got two planes intersecting in, in a three-dimensional space, so it has to either be a line or the entire tangent space. So this uh, is a line, is, well, I should say maybe generically, a line in the tangent space of sigma. And uh, so L equal the union of Lx over all points x in sigma is a singular line field on sigma, we can integrate to get a foliation, get a singular foliation. So it's usually called the characteristic foliation. You need to denote it by sigma sub C. Um, <clears throat> so example, so you can kind of see something. If you look at the standard contact structure on R3, and if you look at kind of the unit disk, I'll leave it as an exercise. You can kind of work out the standard, the, the foliation is, maybe I should use a different color to indicate. So there's a singular point at the origin because the, the, the disk is tangent to the contact planes there and then just everything radially runs out. So it's pretty easy to see. Um, C is called over twisted if uh, there exists an embedded disk. Well, such that the characteristic foliation on the disk looks exactly like the following. So here's the disk. The characteristic foliation, well, it starts out with the singularity here, but the whole boundary is going to be um, in the characteristic foliation, and there's a spiraling out to the boundary. Okay. So if, that is a, if there's a disk that looks like that, um, the then the contact structure is called over-twisted. Um, otherwise, C is tight. So again, Andras told us a lot about this stuff yesterday. Um, So fact, uh, C standard on S3 is uh, tight. Okay, finally we can get to what we really need here. These are just kind of definitions we're going to need along the way, but what we really need is the following. So a surface sigma in uh, MC is called convex if there exists a vector field V transverse to sigma uh, such that the flow of V uh, preserves C. So this, so, a vector field who, so it's a vector field whose flow preserves the contact planes and it's transverse to sigma. What this kind of tells you is if you use the flow of V to get a little neighborhood of sigma, so a little sigma cross interval neighborhood of sigma, then the contact planes restricted to that product structure, to that neighborhood, are kind of invariant in the interval direction of that product structure. So you have this little vertically invariant neighborhood. Okay, so that's the way you should think of a convex surface. A convex surface is a, a surface that has a vertically invariant neighborhood. Okay? Okay, another fact, all closed surfaces uh, are C infinity close to a convex surface. 
So given any closed surface, you can just perturb it C infinity, in a C infinity small way uh, to make it convex. Um, same true for, uh, sur uh, for uh, surface with boundary if the boundary is Legendrian and So I guess I didn't um, define this. Again, it's been talked about several times, so maybe I won't spend the time to write down the definition, but I'll write it like this. The twisting of the contact planes along the boundary um, with respect to the, the framing given by the surface. So remember, if you have a Legendrian curve, the contact planes kind of twist around that Legendrian curve and they give a framing to that curve, right? So we heard about this yesterday in, in Andras's talk. Um, again, you can just take the normal vector to the contact planes and just a, a, a vector transverse to your curve gives a framing on that curve. Um, so you have this contact framing on this, on this Legendrian boundary, but you also have a framing coming from the surface. And the twisting um, of uh, the contact planes along the, along the boundary is simply the framing given by the contact structure relative to the framing of, of the surface. And if that happens to be negative for each boundary component, um, then you can also perturb uh, the this, this surface with boundary to be convex. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, now that you say that, maybe uh, same is true just because this is being recorded for posterity. Maybe I'll put the quotes there to make sure. So um, <clears throat> what, actually, what you actually have to do is near the boundary, you have to kind of perturb. There's a normal, there, there's kind of a standard model for a Legendrian curve. So you look in the standard model, you make things look nice there first. And when you, to do that, actually, you might have to do a little bit more than a C infinity perturbation. You might have to be a C... A C, C one or maybe even C zero perturbation near the boundary. But then once you've done that, you can do C infinity everywhere else just by the standard proof. The only thing is you just, if you fix things up near the boundary first, then you can just do the standard proof everywhere else. But you, you have to use the standard model near the boundary to fix that up first. And there you have to maybe do a little bit bigger perturbation than C infinity. So, so that's, that's what the quotes mean. Okay. All right, so let's see. So let gamma sigma equal uh, the set of points in sigma such that uh, the, this vector field, so remember this is the vector field that's transverse to sigma, is actually uh, contained in uh, the contact planes at that point. Okay. Well, so, so twisting is what kind of Andras was talking about the other day. If you have, um, for instance, if there's only one boundary component here, so this is a ciphered surface for the knot, it's just kind of the twisting with respect to the ciphered surface would be the Thurston-Binnikin invariant. But if there's more than one boundary component, you can't call it the, the Thurston-Binnikin, but it is still somehow the twisting with respect to whatever that, natu whatever that surface is. So here I'm telling you the surface gives you the framing, and then you're going to measure the contact framing of the boundary with respect to the framing given by the surface, and that's the twisting. Okay. Uh, the standard proof, okay, so the standard, the, the way you prove the first part is, um, the first thing you want to prove is that any generic property of a singular foliation is a generic property of a characteristic foliation. So what that means is, if you look at all singular foliations on a surface, you know, so this is some space of things, <coughs> there's generic properties. Like, for instance, um, a, a generic singular foliation on a surface will be more smale. This is a nice pro a generic property of singular foliations. Well, the first thing you want to do is prove that any generic property of a singular foliation is also a generic property of the characteristic foliation, which means, given any surface, any surface in a contact structure, you can perturb it by, you know, whatever is appropriate, in a C-infinity small way, to achieve that generic property. So what you do is you, you prove that fact, and then, of course, that tells you that you can perturb your, uh, your surface so that it is, uh, the characteristic foliation is more smale, and then you can just by hand construct the vector field. Um, and uh, Giroux tells you how to do this in his paper, I don't know, it was back in, I don't know, kind of his first paper on convex surfaces. It's in there. There's also versions of it. Oh, by the way, I guess I should mention, um, I recently taught a class in contact geometry, wrote some notes on convex surfaces. They're on the web, and you can find the proofs of this there. How, how's that? That's better. <laughs> Saves time. Uh, 
But anyway, I, didn't, I don't mean to dodge your question, but does that kind of give you a, a basic idea of what to, okay, good. Okay, so let's see. Well, we're running out of time here, but so today I'll probably just manage to finish all the facts about convex surfaces I need, and, and then we'll have to come back tomorrow and actually prove uh, the ontoness and the one-to-oneness of this map of Giroux's. Okay, so we got this uh, set gamma. Uh, this is a multi-curve on sigma. So what I mean by that is it's a union of simple closed curves oh, and maybe arcs if there's boundary. Uh, so it's a, so a multi-curve, uh, i.e. union of simple closed curves. and properly embedded arcs. So that's the first property, is, that's what, is that it's a multi-curve um, called... Yes, a uh, union of embedded... Uh, of Hopefully that clarifies, okay? So it's an embedded multicurve. So they don't intersect each other. They don't intersect themselves and they don't intersect each other. Um, so it's called uh, the dividing set. Uh, so facts. Sigma minus gamma sigma. Um, so it's called the dividing set and luckily it actually divides the surface into two pieces. By the way, each of the pieces might be disconnected. So I'm not claiming it's just two pieces, but I'm saying there's at least two pieces and there's kind of a natural way of dividing it into these two pieces. Uh, two. Uh, so oh. the dividing curves are actually transverse to the characteristic foliation. And there's a third property. Uh, I guess maybe I can fit it in here. No, I can't. This is a vector field V, uh, I shouldn't call it V, uh, W, no, uh, U, uh, and volume form omega on sigma such that A, V directs the characteristic foliation. So what I mean by direct, I mean it's tangent to the characteristic foliation where it's non-singular and where it's singular it's zero. So the vector field zero at the singularities and tangent to the, to the foliation where it's non-zero. Okay, is there a question? Yes, thank you. Excuse me? Oh, what d directs mean? Uh, okay. <laughs> B, uh, the flow of U uh, expands, contracts, so it expands or contracts omega on sigma plus sigma minus. So in the positive region, it kind of expands the volume form. In the negative region, on sigma minus, it uh, contracts the, uh, the volume form. And finally, C, V points out of sigma plus. Okay. So these are three properties of dividing curves. They're kind of important properties. Um, there's an interesting little fact you can try to convince yourself of. That's what happens when you change notation, but uh, I didn't want to confuse it with the V that was transverse to the surface. And anyway, okay. Hopefully, this is all correct now. Um, so, fact uh, on compact subsets of sigma plus, we can isotop. Uh, C to be arbitrarily 
close to sigma plus. Okay. So remember, this is the property. If, if an open book was to support a contact structure, you could, you could isotop the contact planes arbitrarily close to the pages. Well, it's kind of important for us later on to notice that um, on the positive region, you can actually isotop the contact planes very close uh, to the tangent planes to the surface. So which is what? What is sigma plus? Oh, s s sigma, sigma plus, you see the dividing curves divide the surface into two pieces, and sigma plus is the region on which this vector field that you have expands the volume form. It's where it expands, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is just a fact I'm going to state. It's not so obvious from what I've said here, but if you kind of think about these properties, you can actually prove that without a great deal of trouble. Um, Okay, let's see. Well, there are actually a few other properties of convex surfaces we need, but since we're essentially out of time, what I think I'll do is I'll state those last couple of properties tomorrow when we actually prove uh, Drew's, uh, the big part of Drew's theorem, the ontiness and one-to-oneness of that map, but also uh, Stefan uh, Schoenberger later on this afternoon will tell us more about convex surfaces and probably he'll tell you everything else I need, but again, I'll quickly review some of it uh, tomorrow anyway. Um, and we'll just pick up here tomorrow.